first seeing, you know, people like on the decks and people doing graffiti and, you know, it blew his mind. And that's why I think he come up with the idea as well to think about, about Buffalo Girls and, you well, know. I mean, it's amazing that you got that story from him because, you know, mm. this, is, this is what drives me crazy is that someone like McLaren, I look at 82 as being the point where we know hip hop is going to stay. or Well, we know rap is going to stay. Let's put it that way. Now, you're looking at, that's a nine year span. And I think in that nine year span, the people who were involved in that scene and that community, they know how they want to do it. And it was all about keeping it real back then. I'll tell you a very important club like, you know, in London was a, it was a club in 1981. Um, and the club was called the Language Lab in Soho. Well, that it, goes into Funk Bolleton, who you're talking that's about. That's kind of the first time as well that you were seeing like breakers live you know in london on stage at this um, new york city raptor 1982. exactly i've said this before and and it, it for me it's the example of culture shock in that moment mm. within the faces of those kids everything changed and we watched it again and again it wasn't worth going back to a club night because it was like the aliens had landed and walked in the door. The break dancers and how, you know, this thing was all just unfolding bit by bit before us. You know what but was probably gelling it together, Greg, was probably like the Zulu Nation. I don't think this track gets anything like the credit it deserves in terms of, you know, a kind of stepping stone milestone on it, on hip hop. And that's Magic Swan by Houdini. Oh, what made Danny so good? Was it kind of like, you know, the whole package, like the speed, the technique? Like, you yeah, know, he had, he had all the moves, he, he looked the part. He was a real compact guy, you know, and, and I remember him telling me um, that when he was learning windmills, how he, you know, for hours and hours, he said his, his elbows were bleeding. And it's he, difficult to explain to someone how a mm. rock or an Alna Fish sounded when you hadn't heard it ever before, and it was. Oh, was, you got, was, I was getting good, like goose, like goosebumps. Yeah, because it was the future. It had given me a tape of we've got a rap crew, and that was the ruthless rap assassin. And it struck me at the time that the foundation in this country was not that at all. The foundation was electro. On this week's show, I have someone who lives and breathes music, who started DJing in 1975 at the early age of 15, who grew up in the era of Motown, soul funk, jazz funk, early electro and rap music. We are going to be delving into the vaults and taking it back, way back, back into the day when we first heard tracks like Rapper's Delight, Planet Rock, Johns and Crew, The Message, Man Parish, and all these incredible music that blew our minds. He also managed and uh, the Wicked Breaking crew called Broken Glass from Manchester and produced the uh, style of the streets track and also managed the UK rap hip hop group, the Ruthless Assassins. I'm really excited to say we have the incredible, the one and the only Greg Wilson in the place. Yes, Greg. Oh, yeah. oh, it's great, it's an honor mate to have you on board. Yeah, great. I mean, I've, I've been looking forward to talking on this level. We've had a couple of exchanges over Instagram and, and yeah, you know, a little bit of history and getting back into those days. But I'll tell you what, the first thing I want to do, actually, before we kick it off, I want to give a massive shout out to everyone who paved the way. I mean, we can't mention literally everybody because, you know, we'd be here forever. But you know who you are. And uh, basically anyone watching this, please leave a comment uh, below somewhere and let us know, you know, how basically rap and hip hop uh, kind of developed for you. Um, but let's I'll tell you what, Greg, let's talk about uh, like the early rap and uh, how the scene was kind of uh, developing back in the uh, back into like say 1979 i mean back then there was two pivotal tracks wasn't there obviously rapper's delight and then yeah. slightly later about a few months later you had curtis blow with um obviously christmas, yeah, Chris, rapping. christmas rapping yeah and uh yeah i mean in between that though i, I remember um uh, i had an import by lady b to the beat y'all mm. um I mean, I, I think uh, I'm not wrong in saying that was the first released by a female rapper. So, you know, that's an early uh, track and an important track that you don't really hear very much about no. at all. Uh, what else is around about that time? There was um, 
there was obviously the Jocko Henderson rap. Uh, I'm not sure whether that was 80 or back end of 79, but that seemed pretty early. There was uh, Funk You Up by The Sequence as well. That can't come in. That was a Sugar Hill track, which again, you know, goes down as an early rap track. So there was a few bits and bobs that were circulating just around that time um, on the back of Rapper's Delight. Because obviously when Rapper's Delight came along, you know, it was a completely new thing. Um, and, and it was seen very much as a novelty at the time. You know, I don't think many people thought there was going to be a whole culture that came out of uh, of this, you know, what, what became hip hop. And, and, and for a few years, I think it was regarded as a bit of a novelty that, um, you know, there was a lot of novelty kind of raps done. The Wicker Rap, which was, had a great groove, Groove Records in London um, did that. You know, and I think the the B side, which was called All Wrapped Up, the instrumental got got kind of a lot of plays, and but the Wicker Rap became a, a commercial hit, and um, so you know, I think it was just looked upon as a little bit of a, yeah, you know, it, it'll be here today, but gone tomorrow. I don't think people had any conception that it had last until um, 1982, and the message from Master Flash and Furious Five, and I think at that point you had a socially conscious lyric. Um, it was talking about real life. It was gritty. It, people anywhere in any urban environment could identify with the lyrics on that record. And I think that's when it was really born as, you know, rap as it became like um, fully formed in a sense, uh, you know, with that record. But beforehand, it was just party records, really, wasn't it? You know, and a lot of the time it was over the top of kind of disco grooves. The message, it literally was a message, wasn't it? It was such a powerful track it, uh, for its time. It was uh, it was incredible to hear that. It was so, you know, basically, you know, it's quite, it was very political as well, wasn't it? Yeah. No, it was. It was just like full on in your face, giving you mm. the truth. You know? and, um, and we hadn't had that before, you know, so it was a snapshot from the street and as I say, people all over the place, they didn't have to be in, in New York, in the Bronx or whatever, the, if they were in Moss Side or Brixton, you know, or, or Toxteth in Liverpool, they could identify with the sentiment of that immediately. And uh, it was a great track as well, you know, it was mm. a full track. Uh, I mean, we, at that point, uh, call that uh, type of music electro-funk. Uh, and how we defined it was, um, you know, the, the music was changing around about back end of 81, probably. They really started to notice certain tracks that were standing out um, as having electronic elements and bringing them more to the fore. I mean, one that I always kind of mention, and, you know, I don't think people realise how original it sounded when it first came out was um, D-Train, You're the One For Me. Mm. You know, we had these kind of choppy synth keys at the start, and it was there was some kind of new sound in there. And then on the back of that, you had things like um, uh, time, um, time by Stone, and um, you have an Italian track, Electra Feels Good. Um, and it was kind of just touching into these new sounds, but they're all um, in random places at this point in time. It wasn't we hadn't nailed it down in fact we didn't call it electro funk in those initial stages the first term that i remember was there was a track on prelude it was it followed on from you're the one for me and it took it further down this electronic route it was called um electric funk on a journey and the instrumental kind of dub side that was huge on the black scene and so there were enough of these records now, there were half a dozen, that, that people started kind of saying, can you play that electric funk record, you mm. know, and just mean the, the, the one on Prelude. There was a track out, I think it was around May of 82, which was the same month that Planet Rock came in on import, I remember. And it was called um, Electrophonic Funk, funk spelled P-H-O-N-K by Shock. And it was, you know, it, it, Lyrically, it was talking about what they say, it's not rock, it's not punk, we don't need new wave, just electrophonic funk. And they, this was the kind of term. And so this electrophonic funk kind of electro funk came out of that. People was, again, it was just a descriptive term. Have you got that 
electro funk record you played last week or is there, you know what's happening with these new you know so nothing was nailed down but that's how i remember the evolution and an organic evolution of that term coming about which then stuck around for the next 18 months at least i mean um only recently you know i saw a, a black echoes uh, had a electro funk chart in from 19 well from january 84 you know so that was just after i'd stopped djing so the term was still widely in circulation at that time although that was going to change because morgan khan had started releasing the electro albums in october 83 a few months before that and i think you know the funk bit was dropped off the end of it at that point and it became electro, electro. Mm. i mean i identified between the two in a sense like i would say that something like planet rocks full on electro hashim those kind of things you know like johns and crew all the tommy boy stuff like i was saying i saw that as electro whereas there was other stuff like kind of um things like warp nunk, um you know uh warp nine nunk uh q the voice of q these are kind of more electro funk and it was funny when i came back to dj and after stopping for 20 years and i started playing some of these tracks that i used to play back then that at the time sounded so kind of futuristic then you realize ah right it, it's it's a it's a base a real base on that or you know mm. the kind of this real percussion the, the the mixing the elements of things so it was combinations of what we would previously have called disco funk which was the black end of disco so when disco kind of you know basically lost its way there was always the black music that come from soul funk and you know and so later they called it boogie the, the type of stuff that uh you know uh, but then it didn't have a specific term we call it funk or disco funk and so it was that movement into adding these electronic instruments and then it going off because i mean sean p did a, a brilliant boogie um kind of top 100 for me um and it's surprising the amount of crossover with electro funk as well in there the things that are now termed boogie that i would have i think one day i've just got to write get a whole kind of definitive list and explain it a little bit more intricately of what it actually meant so people you know it is it's hard enough at the minute because i think that that whole period has been so undervalued in terms of cultural history and the documentation of it and people knowing what happened back then that you know you've almost got to go back again and, and put it all down like this talk of hip-hop you know and we're talking grandmaster flash the furious five the message is a hip-hop classic but when we heard it and i think it might have been in the same sense in the states the term hip hop wasn't used to denominate this type of music. Well, it was called uh, it was called rap, wasn't it, or dis disco rap in the early days, wasn't it? Yeah, of course. You know, and we and we come up with our you know electro funk. One pivotal record was, as you know, the Adventures of Grandmaster uh, Flash on the Wheels of Steel, because yeah. that was kind of like the first kind of uh record we was really hearing all these different uh mixture of uh of record disco records and breaks all being scratched up and it, on yeah. one record it was an incredible tune i mean it, it was and it was a strange one because it was a complete outlier of course we'd never heard anything quite like it so mm. what was going on you know and and i'll tell you the weird thing is that grandmaster flash and uh the, uh, on the wheels of steel was never played on the black scene at the time and you know that'd be surprising to a lot of people because later it was i mean in 83 i revived it i only revived a couple of tracks um uh, you know and um, one was uh wheels of steel the other was ryan muchi sakamoto uh, right in lagos which when again another outlier that was from i think 1980 that you couldn't make sense of it it's great it was great but where does it go and now all of a sudden with what was coming out of new york it made perfect sense and so it slotted into it there so and the reason i tell you it wasn't played in 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 the black clubs was because 
it was quite a snobbish scene it was built around imports it, it was if, if a record got in the charts it was dropped immediately it was that was the way it worked it was an upfront scene about the latest music so when that track came in and sampled on that track is blondie rapture and mm. uh, good time chic another one all chart hits that wasn't for the upfront crowd and so that was why that you were more likely to hear that in a student venue or you know on john peel's show than on, you would on greg edwards or robbie vincent or mike shaft in manchester you know it was you know it was a track so ahead of its time that it took the audience two years to kind of catch up to it and latch on to what this actually was and, and the genius of it and it was one of for me it's one of the defining pieces of music of the 20th century you know i think if you if I had to whittle it right, and I'm talking about right through the century, I think that was such a huge signpost. But like a lot of things, it takes a while before you come to realise, you know, how important it was at the time. It's just this thing from another planet that you've just got to try and, you know, what is he doing? It was, it, was it was incredible, Greg. It was incredible. So I remember like listening to the record and I was trying to mimic on the like one turntable, I was trying to scratch the scratch pattern that Grandmaster Flash was doing. Obviously, I wasn't very good at it. I was a little kid, but I was trying to like mimic what he was doing on the vinyl. Yeah, yeah, and and, and it's like when I, when I spoke to um, Norman Cook uh, about, uh, I mean, basically met in 1983 when I was on a tour with um, the Hacienda, short tour of the South Coast, and Broken Glass were, were appearing as well and we met at a brighton gig and um he basically uh, invited us to an after party and from there he came on the bus with us to the next gig and when i was sound checking I, although it could have been even back in his house if you had i don't know i don't know don't think he would have that set up unless i set mine up i showed him the rudiments of cutting mm. and I, I knew now you know the, with the crossfade you know and and I, I i was very basic you know i was never no turntablist but i was you know trying out little things and stuff and i showed him that now he'd seen grandmaster flash he'd seen a, a live performance with the clash but he couldn't see what he was doing he was in the audience so we could there was no nothing to show what was happening on the decks he could just hear this sound so this was the first time he'd actually see oh right and he apparently went home and just practiced and practiced and and you know um, eventually kind of went off in his own direction doing that so that interested me the fact that you know as i say that um he'd seen grandmaster flash but at the same time he didn't know what he was doing he could only hear at that point so we hadn't that visual representation i mean the first time we had the visual representation was the end of 82 with buffalo gals which will obviously yeah. go in and 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 buffalo gals um I'll, I'll just give you a little thing how it how how i kind of saw it when i saw on buffalo gals that the world's famous supreme team now i could see them scratching mm. the record but if you remember on the deck for some reason was a seven inch single and i thought to myself does it have to be a seven inch single I, you know even in that moment <laughs> is that, is that, the, is that the, the magic key it's a seven inch but it, but it just yeah. happened to be that that they were using at the time so yeah you know it was a, a kind of long evolution that before we understood properly and we'd locked in exactly what was going on we were getting bits of information we were hearing these records obviously coming in on import and you know they were changing the whole nature of the scene because the young black audience just went straight for the electro and that became the predominant music which was formerly the jazz funk scene so you know it, it took that over in a sense and it was a it was a scene that was like slowly slowly growing but i'd like to go back to like 1981 actually uh when the kind of uh rock punk band uh, the clash released the magnificent seven which i think they recorded it it might have been like in 1980 or it was released in like 1981 but they recorded it at the electric lady studio in new york yeah. um yeah. but but you know that that was the kind of first time as well i was hearing you know people when seeing like rapping on the mic yeah well they that whole kind of famous trip over there and everything and you know and, and it was the same with mclaren it was mm. the band going out there 
and bumping into this scene that was or, or being taken to it in McLaren's case and um so it was they were the little bits of kind of information that were coming back in and dribs and drabs and the, the, the Greg the little nuggets because yeah. do, do you remember when when I interviewed Michael Holman big big shout out yeah. to Michael Holman he's the, the he's the guy Michael Holman is the guy that took Malcolm McLaren because Malcolm McLaren was in uh, New York in uh, 1981 to promote he was the manager of Bow Wow oh, Bow wow. yeah and it was Michael that rang Bambata up and said, um, I want you to meet, meet Malcolm McLaren and took him to the Bronx River Projects. And that's when he turned up and he started first seeing, you know, people like on the decks and people doing graffiti and, you know, it blew his mind. And that's why I think he come up with the idea as well to think about, about Buffalo Girls. And, you but know, I mean, it's amazing that you got that story from him because, you know, mm. this, is, this is what drives me crazy is that someone like McLaren, uh, is fundamental to the foundations of hip hop in the UK. You know that Buffalo Girls. I mean, it, not just in the UK. That Buffalo Girls is the first video to show all four elements. And even before, you know, I remember seeing, you know, the documentary Scratch and realizing that a lot of people in America. I mean, I'm not talking New York. I'm talking wider America. Have got into turntablism and and stuff on the back of. Um, Grand Mixer DST appearing on the Oscars, which was early 84, doing Rockets with Herbie Hancock. I'm thinking how we got that so much earlier with mm. Buffalo Girls, you know, the, that that came into our consciousness at that time and really affected things. But when you, you read about McLaren, obviously, you know, his, you know, greatness within the kind of punk scene um, overshadows everything. And this aspect is really forgotten. And without it, I mean, it was beautiful because that documentary in 1984, Beat This, A Hip Hop History, the BBC one, had an interview with McLaren. And he's in a pub in London. He's talking to some like kind of breakers about what it was like. And he's describing it. And it's just like, here's this sound like a kind of chiseling sound. You know? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. And then you see a big yeah. kickoff going on. It's, it's all kicking off and it's these kids breaking. breaking. He, he's seeing it for the first time and he, he's explaining how, and it, it's wonderful that, but there's so, you know, we that's it. We're, I've never seen any other stuff where McLaren is talking about hip hop. So that, um, the piece you did with Mac Holmes was, was brilliant because it was amazing, it, yeah. It added in so much detail into that story and, um, you know, gave us more information because it's such an importantly cultural moment, you know, the, the, the fact that this guy from England who's already a maverick character involved in different scenes and stuff is introduced and brought very, you know, definitely into this. He, he you know, he, he knew he wanted to get him there. And then to be, you know, for him to come away from that and to be able to, uh, you know, bring that together with all the other elements on Duck Rock, the kind of South African side, the, the hillbilly side, you know, that's where Buffalo Gals, the title comes from. It's, it's a mm. hill kind of tune. And bring that together and make this, you know, incredible, incredible record. And, and the album as well, you know. Um, and Duck people, Rock, yeah. People forget again, you know, when 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 Paul Simon did uh, Graceland's, everyone was like, and, and quite rightly so, because uh, amazing piece of work. And but we're saying how it, he'd broken all the barriers by going to Africa and doing these things. And, like Malcolm McLaren had done that, and it's just like even later down the line, you get like something like Madonna is known for Vogue. She brought Vogue to the public, yet. A year earlier, McLaren had done Deep in Vogue. He'd done a video of Willie Ninja, the main guy. You know, he was always so far ahead of that curve. And and so, you know, we should be, like, so thankful for that. But it's sad that, that those interviews didn't take place in his, his lifetime where people were asking him. Did mm, he, totally. Did he know? How to did he totally. It's a real, yeah. it's, a, it's a real shame, you know, because there's so much history within that interview I've done with Michael. It was yeah. mind blowing to hear that, and I never knew some of that, you know. When he when he turned up to like, you know, the Bronx River projects, dressed up as Michael said, you know, like in this frilly shirt, and and he's turned up like, um, you know, like in this really colourful outfit, and um, yeah. you know, it blew his mind, didn't it? Absolutely blew his mind. Yeah, definitely, and it would do, you know, you, you, you like stumbling across 
you know, something at source. I mean, obviously the people who were there, they'd seen it develop over the, you know, number of years before, which is why I think hip hop sustained the way that it did. My, my belief is that hip hop, you know, if you want to, you can, the starting date is, is different people have different ideas, but everybody kind of can lock on to that Herc doing his parties at said four and everything. It's 73, yeah. And it developing from the really in isolation. I mean, obviously in Queens and Brooklyn, there were things going on, but it was still very much a New York thing. There, there wasn't records then. You had your DJs in the clubs like Hollywood who were chatting over the mic and it was starting to kind of come into that. And it had all those years. So if you look at like, say, the ignition being um, Grandmaster Flash with the message, that's the ignition point. I mean, you can't say it's Rapper's Delight because there wasn't all of a sudden a whole flurry of, you know, it took a while from the, I, I look at 82 as being the point where we know hip hop is going to stay, or well, we know rap is going to stay, let's put it that way. Now you're looking at, that's a nine year span. And I think in that nine year span, the people who were involved in that scene and that community, they know how they want to do it. And it was all about keeping it real back then. There was that term that was going around. So when record companies came in and tried to, you know, change that, they weren't going to have it. So you got it coming out in pure form. And you can probably be very thankful again to, you know, Sylvia and Joe Robinson at Sugar Hill for that in terms of when they put Rapper's Delight out, you know, um, obviously they, they had the eye on the commercial aspect. They understood you know something about how the, the possibility this trap might catch on and, and and everything and um but at the same time and also you know i know that they kind of there were people's rhymes that were stolen along the way and and all this but it was still a street form and the music that followed it the grandmaster flash stuff and uh you know as i say like things like the, the sequence and um you know uh Funky Four plus one, you know, all these things that were coming out were really authentic statements of street culture in New York. You oh, know, big, and big time. It wasn't like a diluted kind of for the public type of thing, which a lot of things get that way when the record companies get their grubby hands on it too quickly. They they then well want to bring in this producer and that guy and we'll get this writer in to help you with it and it, it all of a sudden it's not got you know that that's that spark of authenticity whereas this did we knew it was for real you know we we felt the reality of this music it wasn't just a throwaway thing it had something more to it and we're sitting here now still talking about it exactly you know <laughs> it, and, and i do think that incubation period was what led to its longevity because it was mm. able to fully form on its own terms before the man got a hold of it you know the record companies got in there and and then take over the record companies you know and, and, and take over the business which it did you know it, so yeah you know what a phenomenal story from just a small small seed you know and i know that before rappers delight that's king tim the third the fat bat band is seen as the the first rap track um yeah you know which it is you know but I, I can see like with that what's interesting is it gives you the kind of link back to the radio disc jockeys and how they were rhyming and how this was you know a, a precursor to people taking like hollywood taking it on and stuff it goes back into all that kind of tradition i mean it's in it's in the black tradition completely you can hear him muhammad ali when he was like you know before his fights and everything making his rhymes up and stuff I'd also like to talk about going back to like 1981. There was a London jazz funk band by the name of Funkapolitan who yeah, released, yeah, yeah. Um, they released a track called As, As The Time Goes By, like they done like a rap, like the rapper edit, which for me was kind of like this, the second kind of UK uh, rap release, uh, in my opinion. Because I spoke to you about uh, TW Funkmasters. Um, well, it was uh, Bo Cool, uh, Money No Love, a track mm. from... 1980 and it's a fascinating track because uh, on one side is is the rap money no love 
on the other side is it's called love money and it's a more instrumental version and on, on money no love both these tracks were played later in new york the new york club scene but initially we got them they were british release it was a guy called tony williams he did uh, a reggae show on radio london and he also dj'd um in carnaby street at a club there and <clears throat> he playing all sorts of stuff and he um wanted to do a rap track his own rapper's delight and um, with his you know he got the musicians together they're all jamaicans and that's why i think the, the kind of sound of it's so unique um mm. and he said about making uh, a rap track and basically it's it's never kind of really considered at all but nevertheless it is a rap track and i i can't think of anything that happened before that i mean they were no straight in you know from I think what kind of um, muddies the water is that with the Jamaican aspect to it, it's almost a kind of toasting, you know, that we're kind of into that area, the previous kind of Jamaican tradition of toasting and stuff. But nevertheless, they are definitely looking to make a rap track. I mean, they, they built it around um, that Dennis Brown track, Money in My Pocket, and, um, and they called it money no love but what happened was that it was a huge track on the jazz funk scene i mean it was a, a small label his own label called tarnia and you know it was massive like initially and then there was another version that was put out by a label called champagne in 1981 so people call it the champagne edit or the champagne mix or whatever and variants of these both these different uh, releases kind of made a big impression in New York, you know, so they, DJs like David Mancuso, Larry Levan, Francois Kevorkian is the main one because I was, <laughs> I was on a panel with him um, and, and I knew by this point that, you know, I actually interviewed Tony Williams, he's dead now, nobody had spoken to him about all this kind of stuff, he was a, a figure completely lost to time. And I was uh, later talking to, to Francois in this panel and the guy was talking about dub and he asked Francois uh, and I'd just spoken about Love Money, Tony, uh, TW Funkmasters. And he said to Francois, how did you get into dub? And I was pretty sure he was going to say Lee Scratch Perry, King Tubby, you know, your traditional. And he kind of pointed towards me. And he went tw funk masters and it was like whoa wow so yeah. this was love money the down this is the other side not the rap side although mancuso is listed as one of his classics the money no love boku but this is the rap side um, the, the instrumental side that uh, francois was talking about but further to this really importantly it kind of knocked me sideways he said when he heard that champagne mix of love money he basically, it blew him away, the, the kind of drops and everything and what was happening and the dub aspect of it. And his his next remix in the studio was D-Train, You're the One For Me. And so that, as I said before, that was a track that kind of was different when it came through and, and it was hinting at something new that was happening electronically. And, you know, Francois was the guy who mixed that and he was bringing in that aspect of Love Money by this TW Funkmasters in London, you know. Uh, wow, that's, I mean, that's that's early doors, isn't it, Greg? I can't think of something beforehand. Well, I sent, I sent you that other one by Lorraine Chase, uh, yeah. which was in 1979. Exactly. Um, yeah. And that was arranged yeah, that was by, uh, that was arranged by a jazz pianist, a guy called Roger Webb. And um, yeah. I don't know whether Lorraine is basically whether she's rapping or she's kind of like rhyming. I'd love to find out about that because that was in 1979. Well, I would imagine that was some kind of canny, like, you know, marketing person in the record company that had heard Rapper's Delight and gone. They'd had a hit, a L Lorraine a Chase, for anyone who knows, she was in a, a, a Shinzano uh, advert and it was quite famous because mm. she was common, you know, they kind of played her as she, she you know, like really kind of company and um, and so it became a big advert and everything. And then this band called Catch UK, I think, did a track called Luton Airport uh, uh, because she said Luton Airport in this ad as well. Um, and so I think that at that moment, they, that this 
kind of novelty hit with this Catch UK Luton Airport, which was based on this Lorraine Chase advertisement, somebody thought, let's get her to do a rap because she, she's not going to be able to sing or anything. It's perfect because everybody wants to hear her, her, her accents, you know, and that's the way it was. And it was like, I think it was just kind of um, a novelty thing and they were quick off yeah. the block. And, and, that, and, that, and there were so many novel, novelty type of rap tunes, weren't there? I mean, um, you know, there was a lot back then, back in like around the kind of 81, 81 period. Well, yeah, like I was saying before, with Wicker Rap and stuff like that, the because it was seen as a novelty i mean even roland rat i was listening the other day greg roland rat done a, a rap yeah rap. i was listening to it the other day i was like i forgot about that that was yeah. it i think that was like in 80 83 around then yeah no i mean it was kind of a field day for them you know because rap was seen as i say it wasn't seen as serious it was talking it wasn't singing it was you know i don't think people really looked on it and uh, anything more than you know a flash in the pan mm. on tomorrow i'll tell you a very important club like you know in london was a it was a club in 1981 and the club was called the language lab in soho well that dates, goes into funkopolitan who you're talking about because that's right yeah, yeah tom tom dixon and nick jones from yeah. funkopolitan that's right yeah and i'm yeah, I mean, i'm the same as you you know i'm learning about these things even more so now and you know i've got a bit of information from from your side uh, in in terms of the language lab uh, i i understood this was the first place where rappers went um uh, i didn't know much about it so it, it's seen as a kind of beginning of of hip-hop in london in a sense um it was certainly the first you know nobody else that i can think of was doing you know a, a a rap specific night you know uh, the music was being played as i say part of the overall palette so yeah and and also that the audience was a white audience the performers were largely black so you know it, it seems that what was happening there i mean i saw your interview with snowboy which was like really enlightening about that well that was my that was mind-blowing again because snowboy was an mc back in like it was the end of 1979 because there was also a rap competition and it was like people to rap over like rap is delight but he tried and kind of put yeah. his own twist on it he done it over curtis blow's christmas rapping instrumental in 1979 yeah. he was emceeing it, yeah. blew, it blew my mind when i heard that yeah well you know i think some people just went you know they loved it straight away and they thought i'll give this a go and obviously the language club was somewhere that could facilitate this it, it kind of strikes me a little bit of, of Negril, you know, what you were saying mm. about, he, you know, what, what Michael Holman was saying about um, bringing, um, you know, like the uptown to the downtown type thing. And so it was an arts crowd that they were coming toward. They were bringing this street culture to an arts crowd. I think Negr um, that uh, Language Lab uh, has shades of that, you know, um, as well that they in a similar way to mclaren and the clash and that they'd seen this in new york so they'd spotted it early and brought it back in their own way and i'll tell you another another big moment as well was in october 1981 the clash um on the radio clash tour um obviously in London at the Lyceum Ballroom, they brought over Futura 2000, yeah. who sprayed this amazing canvas on stage as they was uh, playing. And, you know, Futura 2000 done the piece underneath the Westway, um, yeah. you know, in West London, which was, that was early doors as well, like 1981. I mean, was, was that the Earl's Court uh, or was that after? No, it was before. This was in October 1981. Yeah. um at the uh at the lyceum ballroom in london okay and so you know i mean that would have had an influence on the, the whole kind of graffiti movement in london for sure did they, they they didn't bring any breakers with them at the time or anything to, to be honest it was really the new york city rap tour i think it was autumn 1982 that's yeah. that's the one you're talking about when Africa Bambata, Fab Five Freddy, Rocksteady yeah. Crew, Grand yeah. Mixer DST, Futura 2000, Dondi, uh, Ramelzy, and uh, you had the Double Dutch Dancers. And, you know, they they come to London as well as uh, they went yeah. to Paris and Los Angeles. And that's, right. that's the, the Rocksteady Crew, you know, that's the kind of the first 
time as well that you were seeing like breakers live you know in london on stage at this um, new york city reptile 1982 exactly and I, I think that's where london had you know or, or certain you know i would imagine that the uh, the cruise started earlier in london than they did in in the northwest and the, and, and the midlands and everything possibly because of that i don't know who seems to be the first crew in london but i would imagine that people who went to that event would have come out of that and been started yeah. to think about this. You, Greg, you're bang on the money because the reason I say that is because I spoke to someone who was at that concert and they formed the crew. I can't remember what those called. It could have been the Electric Wizards along them lines. I'm not sure, but they 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 started doing the break. And after seeing Rocksteady Crew, they formed a B-Boy Crew. That uh, you know, early doors like 1982. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I think there was pockets of, of stuff going off in London. I'm not sure when um, the breakers first went into Covent Garden. Uh, that was obviously a kind of major moment. But this is a time where we got to think about it. This is a time where, you know, before breaking, it was like body popping and robotics. Yeah. So breaking didn't really properly come around. So I would say, you know, early 83, when we see the Buffalo Girls video and all that, it was really 83 when we started to like learn, you know, basic moves like the Caterpillar and, you know, and um, all those, all, those, all them kind of moves, you know, that, that would have been around 1983. Yeah, I'll tell you something about Buffalo Girls video as well is, is uh, you know, quite important from a, a Northern perspective, um, very important, was... I used to get all the records from the record companies and, you know, knew all the people who were in promotions and I get all my, I'd buy all of my imports, but anything UK, I just go and, you know, I get them or albums and stuff like that. And I was in London um, and Jeff Young was then at, um, it was Phonogram and they had Chrysalis, the label that McLaren was on. And I came in the office and he just got uh, white labels of Buffalo Gals in, which I took a few copies of. Uh, and he said, oh, there's a video as well here. It hadn't been shown. It's, I'm talking about now, I think it was November of 1982. And so I took this video home with me. At that point, not not many people had videos you know it wasn't like in every household at that point so i watched it and obviously you know i was just like knocked sideways by what i'd just seen and was like and i, I even though legend and wigan pier were amazingly uh, you know equipped clubs like real cusp of technology they didn't have a video and i worked the thursday night at the time in Huddersfield, I had like a big following in Huddersfield. They used to come to my nights at Wigan and Legend, and I decided to do a Thursday there. And it was in this kind of pretty rundown club in the you know dodgy side of town, you know. And but it was a great crowd and really raucous crowd. And they had this video, and I thought I'm going to take it down and I'm going to put it on. And it got to about one o'clock, and and I. I got everyone to sit down on the dance floor. It was like being a school in master, you know, like, you no, know, <laughs> sit down so everyone can see this. And they're probably thinking, what am I going to, you know, what? I showed them it. And I've, ex I've said this before, and, and it, it, for me, it's the example of culture shock. In that moment, mm. within the faces of those kids, everything changed. And we watched it again and again. It wasn't worth going back to a club night because it was like the aliens had landed and walked in the door. People, <laughs> people couldn't grasp what they were watching. There was a man on his head spinning round. You know, it, when you look at the, the move now, it looks so basic and so for what we've seen since. But at that particular moment in time, it was stunning just and, and also it was all brought together right okay yeah getting it to, the four elements are starting to make a little bit of sense and i think that culture shock the reverberated i mean obviously i think it was shown probably two or three weeks later on tv on the tube i think they were the first mm. people to show buffalo gals video 
uh, and then it went into the charts and it became you know a chart hit so it was knocking about throughout early certainly within the black crowd the the you know and the, the the kids who were coming into the clubs maybe younger kids might have been you know different but the kids that were coming into the clubs that would eventually take it out onto the streets and everything it wasn't immediate you didn't see the next week someone trying to do windmills or a head spin it didn't work like that people kept the cards close and practiced away i remember talking to danny price you know like about he said he just like practice and practice he said his, his elbows were bleeding and bleeding from trying to do these things you know they just kept doing it and i can imagine all these kids were just trying to get the moves and then it came out in the summer and it first came out in the clubs at wigan pier and it was the huddersfield crew that, that were the first you know to throw the moves and it was the manchester crew that responded and that was when they showed the cards there was the first time people had gone here i'm out here we're doing this and uh and it was incredible you know the whole the way that it's escalated um not long after that kermit who was already somebody i knew from the scene he was a jazz dancer in the jazz funk days uh you know he's very young at the time you know he said we've got a crew and we're going in piccadilly gardens we're dancing in piccadilly gardens you know and i went to see them and it was, wow they're doing it we, it's happening it's happening they you know they're rolling the lino out they're putting the ghetto blaster they're busking they're getting the money and i just um you know really fell in love with the whole kind of this whole explosion of of something completely different and what i loved about it was on the streets that it broke down those barriers of racism that existed mm. you know, really severely you know at the time it was a very racist time it was thatcher's britain i, I just saw the potential of like why don't we do a street tour of, of, of the northwest it was so go to like areas like warrington liverpool birkenhead you know witness st helens where they had shopping centers and i rung the local newspaper and said we're doing this thing's happening that's happening in new york you've got to come and see it you know this new thing it's called breaking or break dancing where we were said and um they'd come down and they'd take pictures and we i, I used to have an album of it all and it got it got stolen at one point with a load of records sadly um i had it all kind of in there wherever mm. we went and it came everywhere and then very quickly tv came in for broken glass and we did um you know all the the kind of local then started doing national shows like cv tv and obviously ended up on the tube the the one where madonna was on famously in in february 84 you know so and they were touring then they were performing they were earning money for doing what they did and you know so they were really pioneering it out there and it was uh i was involved for about 12 months um and it was it was you know such a great time i, I love those the early period of breaking as well because they didn't have all the i mean I, I saw how it started to change as the videos as we got more videos i remember the one called save the overtime for me by gladys knight that they were studying a lot there was obviously hey you the rock steady crew there was flash dance as well wasn't it flash dance well yeah flash dance i don't think at the time that was just in the cinema so i don't think mm. there was a video to view at that point in time um you know i think that was you know a, very much an american experience with flash dance more than a uk in a sense um I, you know when watching uh, freshest kids it seemed it was very prevalent in their culture where i don't think many people in uh the culture here were turned on to breaking by a flash dance but i know loads were turned on by buffalo gals hey you the rock steady crew save the overtime for me beat this hip-hop history yeah. that beat well, that, this. That, that, I think that was the revealer you know that came in 84 mm. and i think that was the bbc documentary and it had uh, gary bird who did the crown doing the kind of rap narration type thing to it all but it it it, it basically laid it out for us is what it is we saw cool Herc driving around the bronx with those big speakers amazing the yeah that famous footage amazing. showed for the first time I mean, yeah. they didn't. I don't think there's a hip hop documentary in the US before that, um, like a TV documentary. I don't think anything happened in the US for TV before uh, 
the BBC did beat this. I know they. I obviously mean, obviously you had um, obviously you had the film what the film Wild Star, but it was a film. But it was kind of it was a little bit like um slightly like a documentary anyway the way it was filmed the, the documentary aspect yeah but i'm talking about something that's going into everybody's homes bbc tv this it wasn't like wild style anyone who saw wild style in 83 i think when you know it would have seen it through like art house cinemas type thing it wouldn't it wasn't mainstream in any sense it would have been shown at a few places here and there um if you were lucky to even know that it existed so um but that came on TV as well in 84, that Channel 4 yeah. show of Wild Style. And thankfully, I, I recorded that because I don't know if you've ever realised this and gone back. The DVD of Wild Style edits differently and takes stuff out, little bits out, and it, it, not in a good way. Mm. That's cut up. I yeah. don't know if they had some kind of copyright issue later. But wasn't, it, wasn't, it Bob, wasn't it Bob James? He was cutting up Mardi Gras and then they had to change it. It might have been that, but the the DVD is different, and uh, mm. I was always like kind of you know gutted when I saw the DVD because. The, uh, but even though there's other bits that are edited in the DVD that I can't see any reason why they had to edit them. You know, the amphitheatre, just little little shots and combinations of things. I got so used to that edit in, because you know that amphitheatre sequence in in um, Wild Style it's just one of the all-time gigs isn't it you, it's you know. incredible isn't it and that and, vibe and, again when everyone's on stage and, oh. and it's just it's so so seeing that you know and beat this basically yeah. spelling it out yeah. for you spelling the whole thing out that i mean those, I think, those those two those two things they now hip hop into the you know it was a, yeah. it was mind-blowing wasn't it yeah, it was in the consciousness. I think people were aware that this thing was hip hop. I mean, because we talk about, you know, rap music, hip hop music, but hip hop originally was a term for everything. I mean, I'd he we'd had the term hip hop floating around. Lindsey Wesker for Black Echoes, his column was called Hip Hop from, I think, about March of 83. But it didn't relate to hip hop as a scene. He, it probably related to the track Hip Hop Bebop by Man Parish, which was out in the back end of 82, and it was just a good, catchy title. He previously called the column Funk Finder, now he called it Hip Hop, but it didn't just, it covered all sorts of music, as well as electro funk and, and stuff. So, again, another kind of strange outlier, but, but, um, but just saying that the term was there. And I suppose if I would have been, you know, what does, what is hip hop at the time, I would have. It's, it's it's a party it's a, you know i would have seen it as an over for i there was no idea of the different elements you know and and what what it can be and where it had come from and how it evolved and the breaks and the break dancers and how you know this thing was all just unfolding bit by a bit before us you know what was probably gelling it together, Greg, was probably like the Zulu Nation. And when Bambata was coming over, you know, and representing like the four main elements, the DJ and the rapping, the graffiti, you know, it, it, it was like the foundation, wasn't it? And it was like those elements coming to like form hip hop. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think people in London were more fortunate because they obviously got it firsthand. We, we got bits of stuff, you know. I was fortunate to have the world famous Supreme team come up to a um, club called The Exit I did in Manchester. It was quite funny, really, because we didn't have the best turntables. You know, we didn't have 1200s there. And um, I remember they were trying to cut it up and it wasn't it wasn't really going properly. Wow. That, that must have been incredible, like meeting the world Supreme team. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, Houdini as well, because they came oh. to that. And, I mean, I did a night, Amazing. though, my night, my Friday, and they... they they, they wanted me to get bands on and so they kind of suggested you know like a few people and we got a lineup of and this was in november 83 and it was uh houdini and run dmc mm. we had, and run dmc had only just you know within a few months released it's like that which had been a massive tune in wigan pier legend a huge electro track and they were, ended up as a no show. I mean, there's great posters with both the names and on and, and everything, uh, but they ended up, they didn't come over. But it wasn't a disaster because Houdini were at that point seen as the main one of the two because, uh, and, you know, track, you know, uh, 
I don't think this track gets anything like the credit it deserves in terms of, you know, a kind of stepping stone milestone on on hip hop. And that's Magic Swan by Houdini. Oh, such a tune. Because such a it, tune. in that track that he's telling you what's going on, you know, mm. he's talking about the culture. He's telling you, you know, what's happening. Sugar Hill Curtis Blow and Glam Master Flash, you know, so he's naming all the people and obviously mr magic on the radio you know we didn't know this it was magic's magic's wand why is it mm. magic's wand? why is it not magic wand and then magic oh he's he's some kind of mr magic who's mr magic you know and you're getting these little clues and then you're hearing in the lyrics something's going on here you know and yeah the right it, it did go triple platinum everyone was with a blind eye not realizing that people were open to this music and it just had to you know find it's you know it, it like sugar hill was a smaller independent label um the major labels weren't like kind of looking at this and seeing any value in it whatsoever so um yeah they i think they spelt it out quite nicely as well in, in a certain way and give us a few more kind of clues and i love the fact that it is a, a record that tells a story and a, amazing production by thomas dalby Br a british artist you know from the kind of more futurist stroke new, new romantic side of things he did a, an incredible job i mean he was obviously he was came from his track you know the backing track and everything so um so them coming into the hacienda when i was there um was uh, you know great because like some breakers and stuff with them who were so respected by like the broken glass crew that were in there because there have been a previous uh, uh, event where we had nutriment you know nutriment mm. who were probably responsible for the first you know british electro 12 inch and um, yeah amazing L london bridge is falling down what a tune you know and big up to crew as well no that track was much bigger in the north than the south it was huge in the north was it really yeah i mean oh, we uh, used to we used to rinse it down here as well but um... at one point it was just the biggest track you know it was really i mean when i did that classic electro master cuts uh in 94 that was one of the tracks that, that we we had on it you know so it was a really big track and we had them play at the hacienda and they brought a couple of um breakers with them and who came with an attitude of we're going to show you something that you've never seen before and what they hadn't really bargained for was that, you know, Manchester's finest was all in there. Broken Glass were all, they were formed, they were fully, they were off on the way. It developed into, I think what happened was the guys at some point jumped into the audience and it developed into a, a battle. And Broken Glass were brilliant, you know. And, and that was when they announced themselves at the Hacienda. And after that, they got free memberships and everything, lifetime memberships, and they were always welcome. They come in and danced on my nights. I did, like, the Friday night at the Hacienda, uh, which was, like, the funk night, where I was playing all the electro stuff, which was really hard to get off the ground for a variety of reasons, not least because you had to be a member to get in there, um, and the black crowd didn't have money to get membership. They were also seen as a student indie type alternative club. So the black crowd were like, we've got. So, you know, there was reluctance from, from that side and we didn't have the opportunity to just like people to walk in off the street. They had to sign up for memberships and stuff. So anyway, we, we had these great individual nights where they managed to get around that problem. Nutriment who did, we also did uh, a, a big break dancing competition. Um, the northwest you know body popping and break dancing championships or something which was great um so we had these great one-off nights at the hacienda and the nutriment one uh as i say it, it brought broken glass into play and i also did an hour or two no two hours on the saturday i think to acclimatize the audience to the type of music i was going to play on a friday and broken glass will come along and dance on the stage to that and they were loved I mean, at that moment in time, everybody was mesmerised by it to see it, and so they were like local celebrities. And I mean, legend, you know. legendary crew, legendary crew, and there were so many crews throughout the UK, you know, doing their thing as well. I mean, so many, you know, this hip hop thing really touched us all, didn't it? Oh, I mean, for sure, and you know, also in Manchester, you had Street Machine who followed on, who were mm. another like great crew, you know, and kept broken glass on the toes. They were the youngsters coming through and biting at the heels and everything. So 
you know, it was a very competitive thing, but so creative. And, you know, with, with Broken Glass, a lot of people came out of that into different careers. You know, Benji Reed, one of the top contemporary dancers, now amazing photographer. You know, you've got Kermit, who was in Black Grape, sold a million records, you know, yeah. had one album. You know, you've got people who went into teaching. I mean, Swanee, I don't, who died early. I mean, that was a tragedy because mm. Swanee was so full of life. You wouldn't have really expected that. And he was loved because he, he taught across about 50 odd schools in the North. He wow. taught kids street dance. And he, you know, like young lads would never want to do dancing. But once Swanee came along, they wanted to dance. Mm. Wow, to dance. big, big loss. And when they, they did a tribute for him over two nights at a school in Liverpool and they bust mm. in all these kids from everywhere. Wow. Uh, and, you know, Jason Norris from Street Machine turned up and obviously all the kids, it was, you know, they were, God, someone can take that's in there. But, you know, <laughs> everyone was there to respect him. It was beautiful, you know, that over two nights they did that because there were so many people that wanted to. So, yeah, you know, that was, that was just before that we'd done our reunion, our 20 year reunion uh and we've got another one this year 40 years this year we did it around style of the street which was 1984 the single that we did with um the street street sounds uh for the uk electro album um so yeah we're looking to do another anniversary this year because i need i need to go to go to that greg that would be incredible yeah i'll let you know when when we've got it kind of lined That'd up that'd be amazing you know? yeah did you like did you witness any kind of like fierce battles i mean there must have been so many battles well i mean yeah in, in, i mean in the early days they were kind of in isolation you know that uh, in manchester and then bit by bit you know in the clubs and everything it, it started to different crews coming in from different areas um i mean i remember when we went to london with the hacienda review it was called and it was like a tour of the south coast um and we basically um we did camden palace and sidewalk turned up from london and there was mm. a really really good battle afterwards there you know they were a really good crew and everything side you know sidewalker like you know one of the legendary london crews you know you got uh obviously richie rich michael forsyth uh Cher, dennis charles and obviously dolby d you know they was a they was a wicked force so yeah. you know to, to come up against you know one of the legendary london crews that must have been such a such an explosive performance well i mean it was you know i suppose what happened was that broken glass were performing that night uh, at uh, camden um there was kwando quango who was mike pickering's band playing i dj'd and broken glass like um danced um and so i mean sidewalk must have got wind of this and obviously wanted to kind of come and defend the turf you know so uh it was it was great you know it was like one of those things that afterwards it just carried on on the dance floor for ages and i mean i think there was a lot of respect between the two crews you know people were finding out about each other then you know it was uh early days in lots of ways who's he what's he doing you know and it's mm. kind of and finding out each other's names and stuff no it was i just remember it as, as like a really good night and then uh again about what six or seven months later when we had the uk electro album out we did one and only gig at the ica in london um it was like part of their rock week um in a similar way zulu rockers turned up and so again there was like um a battle afterwards with with broken glass and zulu rockers and everything so yeah you know i mean i think that you know like broken glass were you know a, a wonderful crew the balance of the crew was really, really strong um I mean, I was thinking about this. Um, I was thinking about like Danny Price, who, you know, was seen by many as, as like the greatest breaker of his generation, you know. Uh, and I, I remember he wasn't in the original line of Broken Glass. He was an outlier. He was from Oldham. And we had like a, a breakdance in the body popping championships of the, of the North, which the final was at the Hacienda, but we had heats in Wigan Pier and Legend. And he turned up a legend, and I remember that night. And uh, were, who is this guy? You know, and and he, he was obviously really good, and he qualified and got through to the final. <clears throat> and um, you know, you got it from like the broken glass. You know, he, he was biting our moves. You know, he's like they, they're kind of putting in that. And I, I remember having this conversation with them and just saying, "We've got to get him." He, he's got, and and some of them were like, "No, you know." And I said, "If we don't." you know 
he's he's brilliant what made danny so good was it kind of like you know the whole package like the speed the technique like you yeah, know he, I mean, had, he had all the moves he, he looked the part he was a real compact guy you know and and i remember him telling me um that when he was learning windmills how he'd you know for hours and hours he said his, his elbows were bleeding and but he just kept going to get them so his windmills were really on point you know he had the best windmills uh uh and he, you know it, just his kind of um his, his his speed of dancing and also he was good at combinations as well him and swanee used to hook up and do lots of stuff together and uh, and you know you knew that if you put danny in the the it's going to take uh, you know someone really really special to kind of and and, and we also had um patrick booth who was almost he was like we could throw in a move that no one could match at that time which patrick had been like uh i think he'd, he'd been he'd represented england maybe or, or certainly the, the northwest in, in gymnastics so he was quite a high level gymnast mm. and he flares from the floor at that point which was you know no one could do that you know it was uh and he could be thrown and somersaults easily you know he, he had all this on board other kids were learning that now they were like putting these moves in and you know risky moves and trying things out so you know we had that we had, we had some great poppers we had like obviously uh, raymond campbell babyface ray who benji reed really looked up to um and benji didn't join till later so it was I think I, I think I'd, I'd uh, moved moved on by the time Benji came. Although I remember him, I remember this little kid Benji, and I, I, I've see, seen footage of him in a, a, like the body comp, uh, popping competition in Manchester, where Dave the Wave, who was from Broken Glass, won. But when I see what Benji was doing, he was just another level on. I don't think the judges kind of got it because of just how you know he, he he was somewhere else i mean i don't know if you've seen his photography now again it's just you know real high level stuff so benji thought in different ways and went on to become you know very successful like dancer you know and toured and everything and, and stage productions and things you, you had obviously kermit at the time uh now kermit was very early into this and kermit was the first uh breaker photographed by national publication spinning on his head which was in id uh, and Kevin Cummins, who was the famous Manchester photographer who did all New Order, Joy Division, everyone, Hacienda stuff, he got that photo just walking down Market Street in Manchester and seeing him. And so it's very early doors with with what they're doing. And he's got, you know, Kermit was, was the first one, I suppose, to risk that, you know, to actually try to do it. Other people overtook that, got, you know, more spins and, and it went on. But he was he was the first to actually get the photograph doing it. And I, I love this, in those early days, what I, I really loved about it as well is that because there were so few videos to study, mm. that people had to improvise moves into it. And so it had a kind of personality then that was that there's still the British aspect of the personality and, and everything. And so I really like that, the way they mixed it. I mean, one of the guys was um, Tim Bones, Tim Ford who was a popper he did a bit of breaking but he was a bit gangly for a breaker you know so but uh, what i noticed really early with tim uh, was he had clowning skills i think he might have done some training when he was younger and he was always the one that i wanted to take the hat round when they were busking because people really responded to him and and I think that brought that out of him, you know, that I noticed that in him and said, no, that is really important. And I just thought the balance of the whole crew, it was like a team, wasn't it? It's like a football team, you know, and you've got your different people in place. You've got your strikers like Danny Price and Patrick, but you've also got your your wingers and your body partners. <laughs> yeah. and the no, it, it, was, totally. it was the whole kind of thing. It's the whole, it, was um, the whole, it was the whole package, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and so you know, in those days, it was you know everyone was just finding out about everybody else, and the fact that Broken Glass, you know, continued to prove and have that respect. And if you're old school and you know about b-boy culture in this country, and you don't know the names of like people like Broken Glass and Sidewalk, you know, and um, the London All Stars and stuff, the, the Rock City Crew, Street Machine in Manchester, 
to, you know, they, they were another great group like Manchester. And if you don't know these people from then, you know, you obviously don't know the, the foundation of it, how it actually evolved in the first place, which I think is becoming more important now, now that you've got breaking in the Olympics and stuff, that, you know, culturally, you know, how these things came together, how, how it evolved in the first place becomes really, really important. Mm, yeah, well, you need to really know your foundation. I mean, you know, when we look back to the, the the origins back in, you know, back in the Bronx with the break boys and, you know, cool DJ Herc with the merry-go-round, you know, everything kind of stems from that. So you need to know your history, you know, and especially obviously in UK, there's not really loads and loads of history about the UK scene, is there? Not loads. No, I mean, hardly any, to be honest, you know. I was discussing this with um, a, a writer who's in a book at the minute, you know, about kind of uh, the electro period and how, you know, we don't know even how that evolved. If we do see it in a book, it was the, there was this thing called electro or electro funk and maybe Planet Rock gets a mention or something. And then it's moved on. It's looking for house. It's looking for the next thing we don't we don't know where this evolved from what how how this music first came into play what um engaged people with it all these things that you want you know if you're talking about the house scene we know these early records was we get the kind of history of where it was happening what was going on the people who were involved and that's been completely overlooked i think a lot of that is you know again you know you've got morgan's story the street sound and if you don't have that in the picture, it takes out so much around it. If you have it in the picture, you've got to go and look at it then if you really want to study it, you've got to understand. But while it's been ignored, and you know, what re uh, the reasons that might happen, I mean, my, my kind of feeling is that in a sense that um, when Rave happened, it was such a big explosion, it blew up massively and it brought into the picture a lot of people that weren't dance people. They weren't coming from a dance background or a rap background, whatever you want to call it, you know. They were coming from maybe indie bands and stuff like that. And But they'd taken a little pill and now they'd seen the promised land. And the documentation at that point almost kind of started to look at that as a year zero and the Ibiza myth came into play, the DJs come in and there was a presumption they brought house music back to the UK, which wasn't the case, it was already there. Um, and, and I think with Morgan at that very moment that all this happens, that is when Street Sounds goes belly up and it's over and a lot of people are left out of pocket and so there's a lot of disgruntlement about that people are bitter towards him because they feel that you know they should have had a payment and they never got it and i know i know all that and i kind of think that he got buried a little bit within all that situation and time goes on and books are written and documentaries are made and nothing is mentioned in anything to do with the being even a street sounds when in reality its cultural significance is absolutely huge it really because it is the conduit that took this underground music into a mainstream setting and and absolutely you know um set the tone for what was going to happen with the house era and the hip-hop era you know we the, the whole kind of thing was set through that street sounds uh series i don't think people have the conception of how big it was how many they sold um and not just the sales and the sales alone he, he sold massively with those albums but can you imagine the amount of tapes that were made from from tapes mm. you know that's what happens someone would buy something they tape it for the mates and it would and tape to tape <laughs> yeah yeah so it, it just spread like wildfire you know throughout this country and into europe and not just europe you know i hear from people in new zealand and australia who talk about how street sounds was fundamental to their experience so here you have this cultural phenomena that's happening in the uk that's bringing underground black music to the surface and is laying these foundations for dance culture to thrive within the next few years. And it's absent. It's not there. 
So that's pretty much apart from the people like yourself and other people who show interest and have some understanding. But but on a general level, I don't think people have a conception. And then that's not even going into the breakdancing thing of it. I mean, I remember they used to have these programs on the TV. I love the 80s or whatever. And, they, you know, they do a section on BMX, which is great, you know. But there was nothing there on breakdancing. And, you know, and, and the significance of that, you know, in, at that moment in time, how that, you know, it infected everybody and it spread out everywhere so that, you know, Anywhere in the country, you could probably walk into a shopping centre and find a group of kids like trying to spin on their head and stuff. Mm, so it, totally. really, it was a big cultural effect. And, you know, I, I tell the story about um, when I took Broken Glass on this street tour of the north. We literally, it was literally turning up at shopping centres. But beforehand, I'd ring the local press and say, there's this thing coming from New York and they come down, take photos and everything but within that process we were going into areas that had no black people at all um and i think one place we went to i think it was witness and we got in there and it was like a kind of town square type vibe and when you saw them kind of walking along it was like a group of you know a dozen black kids in, and you could see like local lads and stuff looking what is going on they, 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 was, you know it was almost like in another situation it could have become a violent situation that's the times that we lived in and they kind of watched them from a distance roll out this lino and pull out this kettle blast and then start playing the music and dancing and what i witnessed was this amazing thing that these kids gravitated towards broken glass and the next thing there were conversations and i was aware that some of these kids had never spoken to a black person before but now they were saying oh what's the music what's this dancing and this exchange was going on and that was a microcosm of what was happening right throughout the country at the time that there was this coming together with with white teenagers and black teenagers and asian teenagers and they were like exchanging mm. kids their parents generation would have been overtly racist and they probably lived growing up with racism in their ear all the time but now because they'd seen this this incredible thing and, and the thing is uh greg uh what we gotta you know think about is instead of you know fighting each other when pulling out knives and things like that they was they was battling each other with respect on the dance floor with their moves so it's kind of taking it back you know back to the the era of, of the bronx when they was battling each other you know yeah. doing their moves exactly you know it was uh it allowed you to be competitive and your pride of your area and everything but without it you know it, without it becoming violent which mm. as you know that's the way things were in the bronx and, and that's part of the story is that, you know, they had to pull back from that because it, they'd gone into the abyss really. And, and hip hop was one of the main things that enabled, well, it did enable the Bronx to revive. I mean, I love the piece in The Freshest Kids where the, the break is being interviewed and he's saying, you know, you know, they say we're bums, we're the worst, you know, but, but we're the freshest kids we can do this you know yeah. and that, that's the, 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 you've got nothing nothing yet you invent something now that's going to be in the olympics people know worldwide yeah they were the freshest kids definitely you know it, it's it's and incredible I, and as i said er, earlier on you know with with the uh, zulu nation as well with the peace unity yeah. love and having fun you know, it was just like, it was such a friendly and, you, you know, it was it was a great atmosphere. You was buzzing off the music, buzzing off the dancing. It was just like everyone would get down and throw down on the floor and bust some moves. Yeah. And you could get that testosterone out and everything. <laughs> yeah, totally. Being on the football terraces or whatever, you know, it was, it was, yeah. It, it, so, so, yeah, it, it saddens me that within the documentation of popular culture in this country that this is just so underplayed 
um, mm. if not ignored, you know, if not completely ignored, as though it didn't really matter and there wasn't much about it. And yeah, you look at yourself, you know, and, and you're representative of many, many people that it's, it's completely affected your life. You know, it's, it's, it's led you, it's, it's taken you into a direction where you are today, you know, you're still connected to that. It was still so powerful that it's there. It's not it was, it was, it was an amazing time. And all, and also what we'll have to do as well, uh, Greg, is put your Street Sounds uh, interview as well. Hopefully put the link in the description below where people yeah. can click on that and get the knowledge with the Street Sounds label. Yeah, well, that was a really in-depth interview with Morgan. And, mm. you know, I know Morgan from way before Street Sounds. I knew him from, like, 79, even maybe 78. He was working for PRT Records in London. And they had, like, loads of great labels like Casablanca and Vanguard. And then they signed Sugar Hill, you know. And he was, he was sent over to New Jersey to meet the Robinsons for that deal and everything. And so Mor Morgan you know, was there from the off, you know, with, with hip hop in a sense in the UK. Anybody watching this, please tell me, you know, what you thought of the uh, the Electro and the Street Sounds label and leave a comment below. And also check out uh, Greg's interview with Morgan Khan because it'll be, yeah, it'll be absolutely mind blowing. Yeah, and it's great to get all that down, you know. Mm. <laughs> Even if you know, somebody interviewed him generally, I mean, I've asked him, I've talked obviously about Street Sounds and Street Sounds Electro, but generally that's where people are focused whereas i'd say half of the interview is telling you how he kind of came into this type of music that he was working with how he was treated in the industry he he, he received a lot of racism being an indian guy you know like um in the industry at the time mm. and so you know you, you kind of get a, a feel of his how it was for him and how, how, how frustrating it was when he's got this passion, this love for this music, and he was being hit with barriers all the time. So, you know, amazing character to knock down them barriers and push forwards. Yeah, exactly. That's what he was doing. He was, he mm. was and, and, and what happened as well in the early 80s, what changed in the music business was that um, in the 70s, you had all these club promotion departments, every label, I was on all the mailing lists and it was great, you know, we got all free records sent through the post, but they were only UK releases, they weren't the imports. A couple of the labels like Warner Brothers and CBS would send you imports, you know, uh, and if I went to London, I could pick up albums and bits and bobs that they hadn't mailed and things like that. So I had that kind of uh, relationship going on there uh, with, with all the people within club promotions. But they were like always the poor relation at the record company that the radio had a nice big swanky office and the marketing, but club promotion, put them in a broom cupboard somewhere, <laughs> give them a load of records, let them mail them out. Mm. But they were getting the results. And as this process went on and moved into kind of the early 80s and certainly when British bands like Lynx and Freeze started going in the top 20, Imagination, then the record companies took notice. And at that moment, they started to, um, that was where uh, dance divisions within record companies started to emerge. And Morgan was right at the start of that with, with R&B, you know. Um, and so in the in coming years, people who came from a background of club promotions now were signing the acts or license. Like pe people like Pete Tong and, you know, Jeff Young worked for Phonogram. And, you know, so it opened up then and that enabled all these labels to start appearing, dance labels, which were all set up nice and ready for when the house thing kind of explodes. And so mm. Britain was in place. And at that point, British dance music uh, could stand on its own two feet proud and lead the way in, in certain respects. And, and I can't see how that could have happened, certainly not so quickly without... Well, it wouldn't happen without electro you know i mean a lot of that first wave of british dance artists were schooled on electro you know and they'd say so you know it was a very important time and all those promoters djs like yourself you know playing this and promoting this underground music was pivotal back then you know you were spreading you know this amazing music throughout throughout the whole you know whole of the uk 
Well, that that's what it became for for sure. You know, I mean, the uh, um, the jazz funk scene, which kind of predated the electro funk, um, and, and crossed over with it very much. So, um, you know, the the that was a huge underground again something that is just not documented to any mm. level which is crazy because that's that's the first scene where you really see black and white coming together on on an equal footing you know that it's all about the music it's like it's not like um i mean there were venues obviously that were more white kids venues with more black kids but there was always the crossover and so the jazz funk scene was like massively important in in bringing people together um and again as i say we don't really have that much in terms of documentation uh, about that snowboy wrote a really good book um with some great interviews and that's you know probably the main source that we have at the minute and, and such an important again you know massively culturally important you know about what happened in this country how how young people um you know from from different backgrounds came together and and how music was important i mean it's all documented with northern soul it's documented with the mods um, it's documented with rave uh, but this mix of black white asian you know coming together and creating something that, that has lasted till till today you know that is still prevalent now and uh you know we, we don't have that we don't <laughs> have that for reference it's, it's crazy what's um what's snowboy's book called you know? it's something like uh from jazz funk to acid jazz maybe something like that um it, it's uh, it's really really good you know uh, you know he put a lot of a lot of love and heart into that and the interview I mean, he came up and interviewed me in the north he covered all the country you know he, mm. he, he i mean obviously he knows all about what happened in london but he, he made the effort to bring in the rest of the story as well to it so so it's an important book for me that and um i don't think he got the love for it you know which he should have but i'm also going to put the link to snowboy's book in the description below because i think that is a very very important documentation of the jazz funk scene yes for sure and i'm moving on into the kind of jazz dance scene and the acid jazz scene that follows that so it's showing that lineage and how that works and everything and all these things kind of intermingle because well, by the time acid jazz comes along, that also takes from rare groove, you know, to, to bring into that kind of jazz flavor, you know, so everything, these, these strands always kind of cross and go up on their own directions, but they're all part of the same source, basically. Going, um, going back to Broken Glass, you know, what, what a name, Broken Glass, I mean, how did they get their name? It's a, it's a brilliant name. Uh, from the message, Broken Glass Everywhere ah so that's where they um they got it from i mean a lot of the time people mis mistook it for breaking glass because there was a film out around that time called breaking glass and also breaking as in break dancing so um but no broken glass and they got it from the message i was just thinking about as well with kermit and how <clears throat> he was you know a kid who was really ahead of the curve you know he was and so he was like quick into like break dancing when it came about um, one of the original members of Broken Glass, but he was also quick away from it as well. I remember seeing it um, the the following year in '84. It just went massive, and all the mm. films started coming out, and uh, and then the next thing we got the Weetabix advert. Subway Art as well. Subway Art come out. Yeah, but we also got the kind of commercialism that came into play then, and you know. Prince Charles doing body popping and, uh, you know, uh, as I say, that Weetabix ad that they had uh, with the guy spinning on his back. And, and I think Kermit was very aware quickly that all these young kids, and I mean young kids, they're now like 12-year-old breakers and stuff starting to emerge. And, um, and I, I just think, I just think that he 
from his aspect, it wasn't so cool anymore. And that's when he started rapping. He he would say that he he had an injury to his knee and that kind of ended his breaking days. But I think he just like saw that the over commercialization again, you know, with the freshest kids, it talks about that from the New York angle and how uh, Rocksteady crew all of a sudden couldn't get into the clubs that they helped build the reputation of, you know, and it had gone, it had left, you know, and they were all of a sudden stranded and nobody was seemingly, in. they were moving on to BMX bikes or whatever it was, or, you know, the next thing they were looking at and they saw it as a fad and they just like threw it away at the end of the, you know, how it revives again, you know, these things kind of don't die. If they mean something, people keep and, and the spirit moves and a new generation takes that on. And, and as I say, eventually now it's, you know, it's crazy that it's in the Olympics. It's um, been mind mind crazy. blowing. Mm. I want to. I'm, I'm fascinated to see how they they judge it. I mean, because you, if you look at, I mean, what, what what can be done now is just you know madness. I mean, not just in breaking in Pequa, all sorts of things. You're seeing people doing crazy things with the body. I think breakdancing had a big part of that. In in you know, once you see somebody spinning on their head, you know it's possible. And then it's a matter of how do I find a way of <laughs> doing that? And then once you get to that stage, then if you can spin on your head, maybe you can do all the crazy stuff. And that's what they've developed to, to a, a level that you could never have imagined. I mean, some people say that uh, as uh, incredible the moves that people are doing now, the actual dance maybe has been lost within that, within the power moves of, 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 of how b-boying is these days. Uh, but yeah, I, I kind of look back as, as I say at those times and um, and how the naivety from the British side because we were just getting the, the scatterings of information, but how that was really put together in such a, a special way, you know, that was uh, infused the British personality, you know, of course, you know, and, and the taking it. So those early days. As I say, I, I especially enjoyed because it had a lot of creativity just plucked out of, and that was the nature of it. That's what had been happening in the Bronx and everything. It was just pure creativity. What can we do? What's the next move we can pull? How can we shock you? You know. And the thing uh, is, the uh, thing is, Greg, it wasn't. It wasn't just about the moves and. Y- it was it was the full package you know you had to look the part so basically like fashion was key you know it's one of the uh, elements of hip hop so like the breakers and the poppers would look incredible so can you can you remember some of the early kind of fashion i mean was they wearing like the capo or the the uh, the night windbreakers and yeah i mean you know it, it was at a point in time where i remember that some people were shocked by the amount of sports were that mm. we're wearing that because only um going back into the 70s going into a club you know if you were a bloke you had to wear a, a suit and tie in a lot of places <laughs> that's right yeah totally and they did let you take the tie off once you got in there and the jacket <laughs> but, but, it's so but, true but had, you had yeah. to walk the door so you know all of a sudden people in kind of casual wear um which was obviously as breaking came through as well that became, you know, uh, the practical clothes to wear to, to do this this type of, of, of dancing and everything. So, you know, um, yeah, and, you know, obviously the, the caps start to turn up. So the Americanization, because, I mean, that's one of the other things that you, you've got to take into account is uh, there's a real Americanization of black culture that happens around that point. Because if you go back into the 70s, uh, I remember, like round Toxteth in Liverpool, all the street signs were painted. Street signs were painted in the Jamaican colours. You know, there was a real kind of a, you know, Bob Marley was the prophet, and um, you know, people looked towards um, Jamaica. You know, the music, the dub, and everything. So within the black community, that was in place. But when hip hop came along it brought in the the whole kind of new york american aspect into our culture so like you say that the the baseball caps came into play the, the, you know that which which was a very americanized thing um you know that it became 
like you say, streetwear, um, that kids were now dressing how they would be on the street as opposed to having to wear something different to go into uh, a club, you know, have to dress smartly or whatever. And, and it changed the goalposts. Again, you know, that, that I think about things like how black culture has really affected wider British popular culture. Just little simple things that if, if you see a little kid, somebody will say high five. I mean, a completely a, a black thing, you know, chill out was a black term that I, you know, before there were chill out rooms, even the term rave itself. I mean, it was rave was used in the 50s and stuff, but it had kind of gone out of fashion. But where it comes back into play, it was still used as a Jamaican term for going out partying. And so I remember like kids like Kermit, he said, I'm going out raving tonight. And this is in, in 1983, mm. you know, it was just a term that was used. And so all sorts of things started to come into the culture at, at that point in time, be it, be it fashion or ideas or, you know, slang. And, and it, 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 it's, it's the start of almost the kind of modern culture because kids now in the UK, especially kids living in, you know, cities and, you know, in proximity to black culture and everything, have, have absorbed that. You know, it's like, it's like me, you know, I mean, black culture is a part of my culture. It, it, you know, I'm a white guy, but black culture has been with me so long and so personal and deep to me that it becomes a part of, of you. You know, it's nothing, it's not a separate thing at all so you know that the, that's happened is that um these amazing kids who had to really live on the front line you know because they had this horrendous abuse that was being hurled at them day on day but they found allies you know within you know some of the the what the kind of more adventurous musically on on, the, on with the white kids that they gravitated towards black culture and black people because they knew that if you wanted to find the cutting edge and you wanted to see the best dancers and you know all these things that's where it was at you know if you had a black crowd coming to your clubs you were doing something right you know and i'm forever thankful that i was privileged to have that situation you know that i was playing to this audience and um and so yeah you know and, and that's why it sits deep with me because we're talking about something that's very, uh, you know, very deep within black culture in this country that has, has helped change things so, so much that people don't even notice a lot of the changes where, where they are. They just see, it's just seeped into. And, and, and so, you know, it, it does, it, it's a driving force that makes me want to point people back to a period in time and say, have a little bit of a closer look here at what's going on because you'll find the seeds of what were put down for what grew later you know it, it's all there that early 80s period is, is just such a hybrid you know so many different styles coming into play and intertwining with each other people trying ideas out it's all those electro tracks or the electro funk tracks of the 82 83 period they're so diverse they're coming from all sorts of some are up tempo you know kind of one two six one two eight some are like under 100 bpm you know there's all levels in between it wasn't all one way music later starts to become a bit more you know formularized and it all goes into a certain so by the time you get to house if you go to a club that's playing house you're getting a similar tempo from the time you walk in the door to the time that you leave whereas back then it moved it went all over the place it went quick it went dropped it down you grew with it again and all sorts of other music were coming into that you know it wasn't just the electro it, uh, or the uh, you know proto hip-hop whatever you want to call it it was also um you know the soul the funk the disco kind of stuff that fitted into that vibe and even like italo disco and things we played quite a lot of italo some stuff i never realized was italian at the time but that was it It all came into this melting pot um this music and uh 
and created a, a, a really progressive scene that enabled in a few years time a lot of people to start looking at and experimenting with these you know drum machines sequences samplers and this is where it all came out of you can see the growth of again you know massively culturally significant that we've got a time here where the technology is really coming to the streets you know we were now it's like kids in like puerto rican kids and latinos and you know black kids in the bronx are, are getting hold of the technology i'm in a studio and i'm bastardizing it you know just doing what they want with it you know doing something no one had ever thought of doing with it you know what they were doing with the ace away and everything incredible incredible creativity and uh and a, a particular moment in time it's probably the last moment that there was a you know in, in terms of um sonically you know that we had such a quantum leap with all the equipment the new equipment that was available and um you know we're still living off that in many senses you know we haven't um evolved we've evolved in terms of speed of what we can do things and there's a lot of things that can help us in computers but sonically you know we there hasn't been a, a time when music changed like that it's difficult to explain to someone how a mm. rock or an alna fish sounded when you hadn't heard it ever before and it was there, oh, there was, you get, was i was getting good, like goose like goosebumps yeah because it was the future it pivotal a pivotal track for me back then um was rocket by herbie hancock bill laswell yeah. and michael uh, byhorn which dropped what was that 1983 wasn't it rocket i mean what what another mind-blowing tune you know with grand mix of dst you know on the on the cuts and and, and that record was very significant for the fact that on the scene the you know that i was involved with that i was getting a lot of criticism uh for playing this electro music electro funk music and you know it was hard to fight that off sometimes but you know i felt strong because the crowd that, that's what the crowd were into you know so i had the allegiance of the people coming to the night not these older white people as i saw them who were probably only in their early 30s or whatever who were telling me what black music was and um i think that that argument came to an end <clears throat> and was put to bed with rocket because this was herbie hancock and if you look at the scene that he rocket almost in a sense sweeps away the remnants of the jazz funk scene and interestingly if you go back to the very start of jazz funk and look at the foundation tracks of that chameleon herbie hancock 1973 so here's the innovator in the terms of jazz funk now at a different point in time and he's still an innovator because he recognizes the new technologies and so the argument that people were saying is that people were literally saying oh the te the computer works itself it may you know it's no there's no creativity involved it's just you turn on i don't know what they thought happened but they just didn't like this idea of electronic music coming in. So that was it really, you know, um, Rocket came along and it ended the argument because of who it was. And I mean, later with Rocket, I was, was kind of interested to find out in that documentary Scratch, whereby over here, the, the kind of big moment of um, discovery was the Buffalo Gals video for a lot of people in the states right across the states and some very famous kind of djs turntablists and everything it was the grammy show with grand mix of dst mm. and, uh, and herbie hancock doing rocket which would have been 84 and that was the you know moments of enlightenment and seeing what was going on i read somewhere that uh herbie herbie hancock went to the roxy i think it was around 82 with bill laswell Right. and he and he basically witnessed like bam grand mix of dst dj red alert africa islam and jazzy uh jazzy j on the decks yeah. and you know i think that's where obviously you know the, the, these little ideas are sparking off for rocket definitely and you know bill, bill laswell had a big big hand in that i mean he was great that grammy awards 
seemed to be the spark. And it, that shows where we were at in Britain. You know, obviously, you know, the Bronx was the Bronx and, and the other parts, the Queens and Brooklyn, the, the certain districts of New York were obviously fully aware of what was going on. But we we were quite quick off the mark in terms of the next wave of, of I think the British were, was quick off the mark. Uh, uh, LA, may, you know, you can look at LA and say, well, the, there were British releases coming out at the same time as those early LA releases were happening as well. So, you know, they, they and they had their own kind of background and culture and pop and lock and everything mm. and, and stuff that was going on there. But I think the rest of, uh, you know, much of the rest of America, I mean, they, they weren't necessarily ahead of us in terms of the information that was coming through, unless they had people visiting New York and bringing ideas back and stuff. We had a bit of that over here too. In 1984, you know, you produced the Style of the Streets. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So let's 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 talk about that because I'm really excited to talk about you know style style of the streets. I mean, you know, obviously Kermit started picking up the mic and started to MC. So how did that kind of all evolve? Well, we just wrote. I remember me, Kermit, and Fitz uh, they were at my house and we wrote it and they rapped on it, and um, it was one of the tracks we recorded with martin jackson and andy connell who later that become the uk electro kind of lineup and we've done i've done a couple of other tracks with them and and looks to get a deal with broken glass was the lead track for it then and ireland were like biting on it but we saw morgan and morgan was like oh you know get back in the studio for i think he'd give us a week in the studio and bring me some more tracks and so we went back in, we we, we we just went in the studio and we made it up as we went along. That's the UK Electro album. It, you know, it was all the same people doing it apart from the hip hop beat by rapologists. Uh, everything else is by uh, Martin Jackson, Lindrum, Andy Connell used the emulator. I was there kind of mixing and editing. Uh, and for, you know, Stalder Street, obviously Kermit and Brian Fiddler fits with the two rappers on the and so you know we did the album and everything and and it's funny because years later i i was almost a bit because it was it was very experimental uk electro it was neither us style electro so it wasn't really going to hit that market but it was a bit too weird and left feel for a kind of more mainstream thing so it never quite fell into anything although some of the track music did really well it got a record of the year from record mirror and stuff but as time had gone on and I'd moved away from all this, that I was almost like there's a little cringe of embarrassment about UK. I like, oh, you know, it was like, like your first projects, you know. And, and it wasn't until the early 2000s that I came across a, a forum called Electro Empire website. And there was a great forum on there. And they you know, all this knowledge about the electro scene. It was inhabited by I called Electro Kids, who would have been teenagers when Morgan's albums were coming out, and it was full of these. And I found out from there, and it just blew me away that the UK Electro had a cult status. The people loved it. You know, there were some people even saying it was their favourites. You know, streets. I, I was like, and and I, I, it kind of resonated with a lot of people of that generation and that age group. You know, and it stayed with them and. Um, uh, I was able to like share, uh, there was a, a kind of live uh, mix. It was like the backing for, for there's going to be overdubs. It's when we did the ICA in London. And so I kind of shared that with some people and they heard different bits and bobs and so on and so forth. But then, you know, you, it was quite a surprise to, to find that um, it had had an impact in that way upon people. Um, and style of the street you know again it was i love the demo we did for that we did this really sweet kind of a track demo and i th i always felt i'd over electrified it for the the album it was a little bit too and i had this mad scratching that i put in as well you know and everything. i was almost a bit like kind of embarrassed but people tell me they love it you know i see like you know youtube clips and whatever and this 
people say it's a real big part of their childhood and and so yeah you know i look back in a different way now than, have than you have you still got the demo um greg can, can you can you hear yeah, it well, i'll find demo? it for you I'll, I'll, I'll dig it out i might put it up this year because it's the 40th anniversary this year i started the street coming out so i, I might put it up on, online and everything but I'll, I'll grab a copy out for you to have a listen who, to and everything who was doing the cuts as well to scratch him me <laughs> you <laughs> would you brilliant yeah he was no, he, he was pretty good i wasn't it was it was it was just uh I, it was it was like scribbling i was scribbling on the <laughs> but, no it uh, worked it, it worked it was we just made it up as we went along it really was it was uh one of those and and the tracks are varied in the style and you know this darkness in there but there's also kind of the music's really bright and breezy and real time with the simonde kind of bass in there that's a great you know, tune and also it must have been a big inspiration for the prodigy as well because they sampled it on the track called girls yeah they sampled style of the street they did um yeah mm. that, uh, that was in the about 2002 uh, yeah there it was you know broken glass back again so yeah you know it, it's it's nice you know that it's, um it's fondly remembered by so many people oh it's a great tune and um going back to kind of like documentaries another key documentary which blew us away as kids was by tony silver and henry chalfon um it was called style wars i mean yeah. how good was style wars that's another kind of really important documentation of you know of hip-hop in the in the early days well, again, it was like seeing it from that kind of that particular angle. Um, that, that's you know these docu like Precious Kids sees it from the b-boy angle. You know, um, you know Wild Style obviously kind of encompasses various different things, but is very much coming initially from a kind of graph side as well. And I, I, even like the, what was the British documentary um, bombing? Bombing, bombing yeah that that come out in i think it was 87 but it was filmed so late filmed, 87. i, I think it was, it was but it was filmed before that because i went to a jam called the rap attack at the shore theater and they used some of that footage from the shore theater in 1985 in the bombing right. documentary at the beginning so yeah. um but i don't think it was released until kind of 86 87. yeah 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 so i mean that was it i think now we're starting to get into a time where we're being able to look at it with like quality insights from different directions and mm. to um, you know see the past in a sense to see how this had all come together and um and that was exciting because i mean you know you got the you, when you get into that kind of 86 87 period you're coming up to like public enemy and I think that's a whole other step isn't it once public enemy came into play it was another know, mind another mind-blowing moment yeah i mean were you at uk fresh morgan's event in, in, in yeah I, I, I was there in 86 and i went to uh when run dmc first played in london in 1985 in the electric ballroom uh i went to the lyceum in 1984 with bambata shango and so I was, even though I was still quite young, I went to them jams around, you know, sort of 13, 14 years of age and spat some places like that. Well, I mean, because that's what you, what you did. You kind of grew with it. I mean, from my yeah. perspective, I kind of came away from it around that time. I mean, after UK Electro and, you know, we went in our separate directions. The, the two musicians that I work with, Martin and Andy, they formed a band called Swing Out Sister. I don't know if you wow, remember Wow, I love, I love Swing Out Sister. They had a hit amazing with, uh, international hit yeah well that's what they became the, the the two other guys and uh my life you know i was kind of now detached from djing uh it hadn't worked out with uk electro uh, uh money had run out uh, i could no longer afford my mortgage i couldn't you know my car and it just became a very bleak period where i lost everything basically mm. and just had to rebuild and that rebuilding ended up with me moving to london right and, that, and it was at that point as well that i'd always kept in touch with kermit and kermit had given me a tape of we've got a rap crew and that was the ruthless rap assassins mm. and i got to london i was able to uh initially get them in the studio do um a white label 
and then get them a deal. We got a deal with EMI and we did the two albums uh, and that was a whole other chapter. But, you know, obviously that kind of links right into Broken Glass. What was the first? Was it We Don't Care? Was that the first release? We Don't Care, yes, it was. Yeah. It was. Uh, and wasn't it on the B-side? Wasn't it Kermit's sister, Kiss? Um, I think, I think she, didn't Kristen. she do the B-side, the B-side of that? Kiss AMC. Kiss, uh, yeah. Kiss. Kiss was Christine, AMC was Anne-Marie Copeland, who was the other girl uh, who... And they were just um, Christine and her mate. Christine was Kermit's sister. They weren't even into rap. They were, like, more into kind of uh, the Smiths and the Bodines and the Sugar Cubes. They were, like, real indie kids. At that point in time, M Manchester was the centre of the universe. All eyes were on it. But they were on the kind of baggy side of Manchester. They were on the Happy Mondays and the Stone Roses and Sparrow Carpets. They were all, you know, white kind of working class baggy kind of bands. And existing parallel to that was the Rap Assassins and MC Busby, MC Tunes, you know, different people in Manchester. And everyone was supportive of everybody else. But that separation came in terms of the media exposure and everything and what was going on. So to do two albums and be able to document Manchester from the black side at that precise moment in time was really, really important. Because later Roots Manoeuvre said the, uh, something to the effect that Rufus, Rufus Rap Assassins were at the roots of grime. And, you know, when I listen to that, I think of things like Carson's track, Here Today, Here Tomorrow, and Posse Strong by Kermit. In fact, Kermit was programming the drums on those tracks, so that might have something to do with it. It, it stopped there. Kermit obviously carried on. He hooked up with Sean Ryder, uh, who the Mondays had come to an end, and they formed Black Grape. Mm. Which I thought felt, in a way, a perfect marriage. I always felt there was an affinity between the Rap Assassins and the Happy Mondays. We even sampled the Mondays on the first track of the Killer album. Um, <clears throat> so, so for Kermit, to, and, and not just Kermit, Jed Lynch, who did all the percussion on the Rap Assassin stuff, he, he worked on the albums and he also, um, he didn't work on the first album, he worked on the second album, but he, he also did all the live stuff. And he became the drummer of Black Grape as well. So Black Grape was like, pretty much Mondays and kind of uh, Rufus Rap Assassins. And they had a number one album, you know, and yeah. and the guy, the guy who did all our artwork was Brian Cannon, who uh, mm. went on to become the main designer of the whole Britpop movement. So he did all those Oasis albums. He did uh, The Verve, um, he did uh, Suede, Cast, all those kind of things. He just became the main designer. Like the only kind of, you know, places that were playing like the underground music were the, you know, the pirate radio stations. Because the pirate radio stations were pivotal. I mean, you know, obviously in London we had you in Victor, JFM, LWR, Kiss FM, all these fantastic stations. Was there like um, pirate radio stations in Manchester? Not to that level. The, the, there were some, um, but the, the the whole London pirate thing is is very specific to London. You know, I mean, the, the, that culture to that level. I mean, for example, you know, we had Piccadilly Radio, Mike Schaff show once a week mm. on a Sunday, which was the point of reference for everyone. I did my mixes on that, so I was exposing them to the electro music through that and everything. So, you know, it was we didn't have the infrastructure of the pirates that you had but they did come along um and there were you know some community stations but i don't think nothing that had the influence of you know an invicta or jfm or these kind of these kind of stations i mean we've got to give it to djs like you know your john peel and um mike allen and dave pierce and all these djs because they kind of, you know, they was playing a, a little bit more to the masses, obviously, outside London. So, you know, like John Peel would be very experimental, would play a lot of kind of different styles of music. Exactly. I mean, he was about independent music. He mm. was about things, uh, you know, uh, a shot. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I mean, I know a lot of people who, who talk about their education came from listening to his show. They might have to sit through all sorts of other stuff that mm. maybe they weren't too into, but all of a sudden some gem yeah. would be a hip hop track or a reggae track and, you know, it would make the whole thing worthwhile. Um, whereas, you know, like other people, I suppose, that were on the scene, that they were tuned into the specialists they knew were to kind of... So if you're in London, you were listening to Greg Edwards, Robbie Vincent, 
and then you know like the pirates as they came on board and everything so i don't think you know there was a lot of other kids that weren't listening to john peel at all you know that they, they were too busy elsewhere and more tuned in more plugged into where this source was, was coming from but he was an important you know kind of um outlet for that without mm, him big big he, time you know he played the assassins and uh it, that was the only radio one plays we, we got you know mm. uh, so obviously you know really thankful for that and other, other tracks that i've been involved with you know he was always there to support the the the, the, the kind of the, the small act in a sense trying to break through you know he wasn't interested in the other side of it and, and that's what made his show so special you know was that uh it, it was such a kind of grab bag of of all sorts of craziness mm. but into that you know something like a adventures on the wheels of steel would be played and uh, you know a lot of people probably heard it first on, on that and i'll tell you another actually obviously um you know uh, on a thursday night at 7 30 p.m we had a tv show called top of the pops on bbc one and that's kind of like the first time a lot of a lot of us were seeing videos like the message buffalo girls shalimar when jeffrey daniels done the backslide on the uh, the wall climber as well as like Curtis Bro Blow Christmas rapping and Dizzy Heist with Christmas uh, rapping as well and Adaman, you know. So Top of the Pops was another kind of outlet where a lot of us were kind of seeing little sparks of hip hop developing as well. Exactly. I mean, and, you know, Top of the Pops was like um, basically it's almost like a kind of democratic thing that you you had all these different types of music, mm. that had the best selling music that week on the show and a family because we didn't have many tv stations back then so the whole family would sit and watch and yeah, yeah to to totally what yeah the kids were into and vice versa but it, it kind of it, it enabled people to have a at least some kind of idea of what was going on out there you know um and like you say certain tracks bring through nuggets for us and we you know like when jeffrey daniel as you say oh that, that was a precursor that was before the so kids were starting to body pop well before yeah. breakdown and that yeah, had yeah. everything to do with jeffrey daniels doing night to remember and do, doing pop. doing doing the wall the wall move yeah yeah brilliant and the back and the backslide and like you know a little bit of robotics and basic popping i mean it was it was quite a quite a pivotal moment for for us watching that and yet, weirdly, you know, you think of Jeffrey Daniels, he dates back into Soul Train, he was one of the dancers. I mean, he was the, the, he was kind of recruited as a dancer into Shalimar, you know. Um, and, you know, he was one of the pop and lockers. They were doing amazing stuff back then when you see those old footage of Soul Train. And, I mean, what Stacks as well, you know, uh, which was uh, Stacks Records' big concert that was held in L.A. in, in 71 in a baseball stadium. And you see in the audience, you know, this is, as I say, early 70s, you know, some pop and lockers like doing the thing there. And it, how, so that whole kind of lineage from, from, from that side coming through. So there's your LA coming into the picture. Mm. And the, the, the electric boogaloos and all them guys as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so that had a, a, a big impact, you know, uh, from the body pop inside, of course. But when the breaking came through as well, it, the two kind of incorporated perfectly. Mm, yeah, it was incredible. And that, that's another thing. That's another point to 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 maybe mention is that I remember not so long after I'd started DJing, I was invited to to judge a breakdancing competition to be one of the judges, and it was in Liverpool. And yeah, it was you know fascinating. But the thing that really struck me is everything that they were dancing to was of the um, Cool Hurt lineage. So it was the kind of 70s funk bass. Like the brace, yeah. And it struck me at the time that the foundation in this country was not that at all. The foundation was electro. Mm. That's what the breakers were dancing to. The, so th that's another point where we've lost. You're, we've totally, lost. you're totally right, because I remember, you know, when we was like uh, popping and uh, doing some basic robot and then breaking, we wasn't listening to the funk and the breaks. We was listening to electro and like early yeah. hip hop. Yeah, it was. It was the breakdancing soundtrack electro. But now, uh, with retrospects, people have jumped past that or the, the kind of new generations and gone straight to source. And so, you know, it was like playing, you know, like stuff like uh, 
it's just begun and mm. the Mexican, these kind of things, which is great. But you realize now we've lost a part of our culture as well, that that was, you know, that wasn't the, so if somebody saw people break into this music now, the you know, the kind of 70s punk beats, they have the presumption that this is how it started here. Whereas it didn't, you know, this is all in rewind. We found it out later and kind of went back and discovered that. But it's lost our kind of foundation and the point. And uh, we don't talk about the track, the great tracks that, you know, the break dancers like um, we're into in 83 and stuff. That, that, that canon of music, what were what were people first break into you know oh man i mean like come on the smurf tyrone brunson yeah you know yeah. like cod in the bottle i mean Absolutely, yeah greg we could sit here for like probably a good like half an hour and just like yeah. name drop tracks i mean there were some incredible tunes in it yeah absolutely and, and and it was so diverse that you go in the record shop every week and you'd walk away with at least half a dozen tracks that now you know a kind of deemed either classic or cult classic you know that it wasn't just the odd thing that you found here you know it was like each week and they were coming from so many different directions to be so creative you didn't know what you were going to quite hear next. and i'd love to talk about this as well um greg you know um there was pivotal magazines back then you know like the record mirror blues and soul and black echoes you know can you tell me the importance of these magazines i mean were these the places where you'd go you pick up a copy of the uh, magazine and then you check out all the latest releases and yeah i mean blues and soul was really important i mean going through from the 70s i mean it was like the first international black music publication it dates back into the mid 60s so it, it and you don't have equivalents in america so it's a very important magazine in terms of documentation of, of black music and black culture um when it got to the time of electro uh the magazine really didn't get behind that it didn't support it in fact the northern correspondent who reported on the clubs in the north wouldn't even for a time uh, type the word he asterisked it like it was a swear word so you know he very anti-electro didn't like it one bit and was quite happy to tell everybody that and i was you know he was like my nemesis in a sense you know and i needed him to be supporting my gigs but instead it was like the criticism of what i was was playing and everything so blues and soul didn't really get behind that side of the movement who did was lindsay westbrook of black echoes mm. his color lindsay was a lot more progressive i mean he was really into all the kind of prelude west end type stuff that i was playing again which was like a precursor for this electro sound and stuff um and went right into the electro he's the first person that i saw put mastermind's name in print mm. in 83. that's the first time i ever heard a mastermind never heard them mentioned in blues and soul or anything but lindsay you know was he had his ear to the ground in London, uh, what was going on, but he was also, he'd come up the, to the north, he, so he came to, to Manchester and Wigan and Birmingham and he, he'd, he'd regularly visit. And so Lindsay, this more kind of um, progressive kind of aspect to the way that he was writing. And where was, uh, you know, where was you record digging as well, Greg? I mean, there were some amazing shops all over the UK ringing in, you know, this 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 wicked music i mean was there certain shops that you was digging in crate digging well yeah i mean the the, the shop that you have to shop in if you're in the north was spinning in manchester it was mm. the, the source of everything i mean other shops sold imports but generally they bought them from spinning so you know if you wanted to get it as quickly as possible you had to be there so spinning was my main source and obviously i was looked after there because i had these big clubs and everything although Again, there was resentment to Electro. You know, one of the guys who worked there put an Electro shit jar in the window and he didn't like it at all, you know. But <clears throat> nevertheless, they sold it to me. Um, I go to London as well because, you know, I wanted to make sure that, that maybe a couple of bits here and there that didn't kind of reach the north. It's the same in the south. Certain things come in at different places. And I ended up, my main shop in London was City Sounds. Mm. 
I mean, people talk about Groove, but I think kind of, I remember a time when I went into Groove around 82, because I know that the guy who served me, he fed a little story to the, with Blues and Soul did a little gossip column. And it, it kind of come out that he was saying that he had to really persuade me hard to get this record, which it was a record that I already had that I bought in Manchester. I was, I was after kind of more electro stuff I was looking for and I didn't get that vibe. But later Groove became the main shop with electro. It became, mm -hmm. they charts, they were very linked in with Morgan and everything. But at that point, you know, 82, 80, going into 83, I felt city sounds, you know, uh, certainly more receptive and everything, and they were kind of looking for that kind of stuff as well. So, so really, they were they were my my main source for spinning. My your your go, your go to, yeah. There were very few import specialists like Groove or Spinning. Uh, these were few and far between. Maybe. As I say, there were other places selling imports, but they were buying their records from the people that were bringing them in. So, like I said, with spinning, they were getting their stock in and they were selling twos and threes out to other shops. You oh. know, right about. So they that would take a kind of process of days or whatever. So if you want to get as quick as possible in there, you have mm. to be in spinning. You, have you, to you be go in. straight straight to the source. That's exactly what it is, you know, um, mm. or, or, you know, or for some people can find wholesalers and stuff. Uh, you know, they, they, this all goes back to Northern Soul Day, you know, kind of buying in the 60s when they were opening these uh, import channels and avenues and everything. We, we were the beneficiaries of what had happened before, you know, people just obsessive about black music who originally written to the record labels in the States to get the tracks quicker and then you know, mail order companies would open up, getting stuff from the States and selling it on, then record, then shops, and then it become more intricate and they got their business together and they could get them in quicker from different sources. And and that's how it worked. You know, we were getting them as quickly as possible that we could, we could from the States, you know, as, as long as it took to fly them over or whatever. And then we were able to play them and everything. And then if the UK company picked up on one of these tracks, um, it would take them about six weeks to turn it around they had to press it they had to get the marketing place they had to sort the shops so if you were a dj that was just playing uk releases you were way behind you were months behind you know so you would never have existed in that specialist scene because you you would have got caught out with the music you had to be up front you had to be right at the kind of edge of that mm. um, um, and that's, you know, that's uh, with spinning, I was in a position where they would bag up records for me that uh, once stuff came in, I could have first l listen on, on those records um, before they put them out to, to, to because of the custom that, that came in and everything. And, and also because if I was playing in the clubs, that would then bring people in to buy the, the, the track in the shops. And, the, you know, like some white people on the radio were so important, Mike Shaft, Robbie Vincent, Greg Edwards, these people, if they played a record on the, on the radio that, you know, they might sell 30, 40 copies of that track on imports for a shop. So, you know, it, it was this kind of infrastructure of DJs, radio stations, shops, magazines, um, clubs, and, and, you know, it, it was quite a big network when it all bore down and it also stretched like the north and midlands was one part of it and then the south was the other part of it there were separate scenes but they were kind of running parallel and very aligned in certain ways um but yeah with massive audiences and so like that was the first generation so to speak the second generation is the street sounds who are now getting this music uh, at an available price um, and and then the third generation you're moving into house and, and the hip hop full on you know and and underpinning where we are at now so yeah you know the, the record shops and, and the radio stations and just the way it all was set up uh, it was our channels of information really mm. well listen so, you know, talking to people in shops and stuff and things like that. That was the internet then. 
Well, listen, Greg, we left the, um, we literally got three minutes, believe it or not, on another oh, okay. 40 minutes. <laughs> Do you know what, Greg? It's, it's been an absolute honor chatting to you and listen we're gonna have to do a part two because i could sit here literally for hours and talk to you all right well okay we will do that i've enjoyed it myself you know i mean it's, it's good to revisit this stuff and like you know obviously some things there's a bit of cobwebs here to work out but you know um there's a whole history to do with um hip-hop electro funk in this country that the more people like yourself who, who are talking about it and, and bringing it into bringing it to light, I think the more chance that um, it'll come, people start to begin to see the importance of it and why we need to understand this to have a proper overview of dance culture in this country. 100%, 100%. And um, you're bang on. And listen, anyone watching this as well, please leave a comment below about how you got into hip hop and you know what breaking cruise uh you know you was in and i'd love to do a little shout out if that's all right uh greg to some of the crews yeah, uh, yeah. A, lot, a lot along the way you know from north south east and west you know big up to all the broken glass all the street machine london all stars live to break aussie's crew barbarian breakers crew smack 19 rock city crew breakers lloyds walk force TNT Rockers, the Wolverhampton B-Boys, Micron Crew, Sidewalk Zulu Rockers, Glasgow City Breakers, the Wild Bunch Crew, Second to None, the Skywalkers. I mean, listen, I could go on and sit here and mention, you know, hundreds of crews, but we all kind of made this scene what it was. And it's, 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 it was a very special time. I take my hat off to all of you as well. And all, the D and all the DJs and all the MCs, you're all amazing. Yeah, and absolutely, and you know, keep on kind of pushing these stories out there and tell your own stories because, you know, we're all getting to a certain age now. We don't want to lose like this yeah. history. It's important now to get it out there. Greg, listen, you've been an absolute diamond. I hope you've kind of enjoyed this as well. I know it's, uh, you know. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's great to speak on this level. I'm often asked about other things and, you know, interviews go a completely different direction because of what I do more so now. But to kind of come back and to, uh, you know, have a look at this period of time. I mean, it's getting that way anyway. I feel there's uh, an interest at this point. I feel something's happening and bubbling at the minute. There's a few things going on that I just feel kind of hopeful that maybe this story will start to kind of come more into popular consciousness. And you're, you're a key player. And please uh, let me know as well with the reunion in manchester yeah. for the broken glass i've got to come i'll bring everyone up we'll all come up we'll have, we'll have a little we'll have a little battle on the dance floor hey, it'll, it'll all go off yeah it'll all go off uh. <laughs> <laughs> but greg listen it's been an absolute honor and i'll take my hat off to you and salute you all right and salute you too you take care